Hey everyone, Ronan here, and welcome back to the channel. We got another interesting part today, but before we get into that, we got to do the usual things, like shouting out the patrons. So Toxicity Trapper, thank you very much for your support over on Patreon. And also, everyone, analytics are very important, so please take a look at these numbers right here, and the subscribe versus undersubscribe. Don't forget to drop a like and a comment, so that way we can help fuel the algorithm and get to a larger audience. And also, if this is your first time here, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications. So that way you'll never miss another upload from the channel. And if you're interested in supporting the channel even further, please hop on over to Patreon or consider becoming a YouTube channel member. You guys get access to exclusive content. Plus, you'll also get access to all of the content that I release a week early. But with all that being said, let's get into what if Jesse and James challenge the Sino League part two. I hope you enjoy. We begin today's part with Jesse, James, and Meowth as they are arriving in one of the two ports of the Sinnoh region. However, this port is going to be one that's a bit odd as they are arriving in the far most eastern side of the region known as Sunny Shore City. As the three get off the boat, Meowth comments how high-tech this place looks. It could be perfect for him to get some of their on-the-field equipment, that way they won't have to struggle for anything. So the feline makes the suggestion that they split up. After all, he might be able to find a couple of tech things that would aid them in the pursuit of this new secret group that they're after. This is no problem for Jesse and James, as they've come to know that there's a gym here in the city. So they're going to take the chance to try and get a gym battle while they're here. And hopefully this gym isn't too powerful, as they don't have all their strongest Pokemon with them. So with that, while the boat is still unloading passengers, the three decide that they're going to split up, with Meowth heading into the heart of the city, while Jesse and James head to what looks like to be the gym gym based upon the map that they were provided before they left the Team Rocket base. It takes a little while for the duo to make their way through the city as it's far bigger than what it looked like from the port. However, they are eventually able to find their way to the gym, which is a lone building standing in the center of the city. However, when they both arrive, they're going to be met with something that they weren't expecting. Rather than being greeted by a gym attendant or the gym leader itself, the place looks almost deserted and when they try to enter the gym, instead, the doors don't open. There's just a notification pointing them to a box that sits off to the side. And what they get is something that was far less expected, is the doors of the box open up and they see what looks like to be a bunch of gym badges, which catches both James and Jesse off guard. They've never seen anything like this. Why would a gym just give out gym badges? They came here fully expecting to have to battle the gym leader for at least one of them to get a badge. Though truthfully, they had discussed that they try to do a tag battle like they did with Liza and Tate back in the Hoenn region, so that way they can both knock the badge off of their entire checklist, but that doesn't seem to be the case, as the voice that is emanating from the box tells them to take one. They don't have to battle the gym leader, as the gym leader would just refuse their challenge anyway. So, a bit confused, and not really sure of what else to do, they just do as they're told, and they both reach in the box before pulling out what is known as the beacon badge, before the lid slams shut, and tells them both to have a great day. This leads leaves the duo even more confused, as they didn't know that this was even something that a certified gym could do in any region. Man, this city sure has given me some strange feels, James says, to which Jesse confirms. However, they both agree that they need to meet Meowth back at the Pokemon Center, where they said that they would meet up after everything was said and done. However, just as James and Jesse begin to walk off, the redhead looks back at the gym, wondering if this is something that she truly once. Now we flash over to Meowth, who has been making its way throughout the city over the last couple of hours. While the Scratch Cat is smart in its own right, the fact of the matter is it's in a big city all by its lonesome, because it had to split up from its two partners. However, it's able to use this to its advantage, as most people just think it's a Pokemon, so he's able to squeeze in and out of tight places without really being seen. But unfortunately, this doesn't mean that it's going to be able to gain any type of information that it was looking for 
as, even though it's able to get in close to eavesdrop on what he may suspect as potential lowlifes, the fact of the matter is, this group that they're hunting has never even been mentioned. Nobody talks about it whatsoever, which means one of two things is happening here. Either A, the group is non-existent and they're just sent here on a wild goose chase, which would make Meowth extremely upset considering that meant it had to leave the coziness of the Team Rocket Base HQ, or B, that means that this group is so well at concealing their identity and their presence within the region that it's going to be harder for them to get any type of information than the cat had originally thought. However, just as Meowth was beginning to call it quits and head to the Pokemon Center, the Scratch Cat comes across something when one of his energy reading signature devices goes off. And in a small shop that sits at the base of a large modern building, in a place that kind of looks like time was just built up around it, there is an old man that sits with a bunch of trinkets on a table as if he is just waiting to make a sale for the day before he goes home. However, that's not what catches me outside. It's something else on the table, what looks like an old relic. According to Meow's scanner, it gives off some sort of energy, an energy unlike it's seen ever before. The Scratch Cat doesn't know what it is, but this thing could be valuable as a potential energy source in the future. So the feline decides that even though it doesn't have any money and it doesn't want to draw any attention to itself with its ability to talk, it's going to relieve the old man of this precious heirloom, as it looks like the old man doesn't really know know what's going on around him anyway, and it doesn't seem like they'll miss it. So Meowth uses its ability to go unnoticed as a regular Pokemon to snake and slink its way through some small nooks and crannies before it puts itself in an advantageous position to grab at the trinket while the shop merchant is distracted by a potential customer. This allows the Scratch Cat to get away rather unscathed and unnoticed. However, as Meowth begins to pocket what looks like to be a broken piece of some sort of plate or tablet, a brief glow is given off and this causes the scratch cat to shudder a little bit as it can feel the warmth from the energy. However, Meowth doesn't really have time for this right now as he knows he needs to get back to Jesse and James. After all, at this point, at least one of them should have had a gym battle. So the scratch cat heads off to the Pokemon Center to meet up with his friends. About an hour later, all three of them are sitting in the eating area of the Pokemon Center when they begin to tell exactly what had happened to each other. Meowth is a bit amazed that they didn't have to put any type of effort into earning this gym badge, to which Jesse and James are equally as confused. However, what is even more confusing is the relic that Meowth manages to swipe. Jesse comments that even though it is old and broken, it could be something that could be nice to make a jewelry out of one day. After all, a girl like her could always use some very, very well-polished jewelry to caress her sensuous curves when she's going out on the town with the man of her dreams. But Meowth and James simply tell Jesse to quit daydreaming. They have a job to do, and like it or not, the redhead is going to have to come back down to reality for the time being. While Jesse is a bit miffed by this declaration, she understands that she doesn't have time to play around, as the trio have now been in Sinnoh for a day, and they're nowhere closer to figuring anything out than when they had left the Team Rocket HQ. They have no direction on where to go, no hint at who the secret team may be. The whole reason why they came to this city is because it's one of the largest in Sinnoh, and it was also the most technologically advanced, so they figured that if they could get any lead anywhere in the region, it would be here. But it's nothing. Then there's the thing with the gym, and them not having a battle for the gym badge. It's quite odd. And this brings the three to the same conclusion. They all want to get out of this city as quickly as possible, as it's giving off some weird vibes to them. But the fact of the matter is, they don't know where to go. This is when James reluctantly pipes up, telling them that he knows of a place, though they run a risk of going there. But Jesse immediately yells at the purple-haired man, telling him that he better speak up. They don't have a whole lot of options. James reluctantly informs them of his family's Sinnoh cottage that they have here. His parents very rarely ever come to the region, so it could be a place for them to actually set up a base of operations. And because it's so far out of the beaten path of any major city, it would be a great place to, for them to operate out of without drawing any attention to themselves. This immediately perks Meow's ears up as a place that secluded would allow it to work on any projects that it needs to without being bothered by anybody that may come looking and trying to gain access to something that they have no business of knowing. Now, while James is apprehensive about doing this, both Jesse and Meowth agree that this is a place that they should go. So, reluctantly, our bottle cap collecting expert is outvoted 2 to 1, so they make plans to head out 
first thing in the morning so that way they can get out of Sunny Shore City. The next morning, the trio are leaving the city limits as they look back one final time, hoping that they won't ever have to come back here. However, far above the city and the tower that looks over everything, a man that seems to be devoid of emotion or any enthusiasm for life looks down over his kingdom as a lone gym attendant asks him why he didn't battle the two, only for the blonde hair to respond that the result would be the same as all of the others. They would lose before I would even lose one Pokemon, so there's just no point in it. The gym attendant sighs as Jesse, James, and Meowth exit the city and we fade a week later as the trio have made their ways through the wilds of Sinnoh to find themselves at James's family summer home. As the three arrive, Meowth comments that he thought that the, his family was loaded, but he didn't know that they were this loaded. This place is even nicer than that house that they had back in the Kanto region, to which James just tells the Scratch Cat he would rather not think about that entire situation. After all, Jezebel is still there, and that's one person that he does not want to cross his mind ever again. The Scratch Cat comments that he was just teasing James, after all. He has nothing but bad memories of that redhead as well. Well, bad memories with most redheads that they're involved with. But he kind of says that under his breath as they approach the door and go to knock. However, it is immediately opened by the house attendant, Sebastian, who lives here year-round in the Sinnoh region. He is extremely pleased to see the young master James, as it has been a very long time since he's had a chance to engage with the boy. After all, James was more kind of like a surrogate son to him when they were younger. He immediately invites them in, excited to have the company of someone else besides just the dust that gathers within this house. James is excited as well, as Sebastian was always his most favorite of all the servants that they had spread out across the world and the houses that they own. While Jesse and Meowth are excited for other reasons, they're going to get a chance to get a warm meal and actually sleep in a bed, which is more than they can say that they've been doing it over the last week. However, this is all going to come crashing down, as Sebastian has some very bad news for everyone. As James's parents informed him this morning that they would be arriving in Sinnoh in about a week's time. So the amount of time that they're going to have to be here is limited as his parents will be here and they're going to be using the house. While Meowth and Jesse are upset as they wanted time to prepare before they had to set off again, James sees this as a sign that they cannot rely on any luxury. They need to make use of the time that they have and come up with a plan and familiarize themselves with the layout of the region. Meowth says that it will get to work in finding some contacts within the Sinnoh underworld maybe there will be some luck there. Also, it has some work to do on their new Pokedexes, as there are a few things that it knows the boss had installed inside. After what happened in Hoenn, Meowth has learned to err on the side of caution when it comes to letting them be tracked. So, while the Scratch Cat gets to work on their plans of attack and the technology that they're going to be using and that small little alteration he wants to make to their Pokedexes, Jesse decides that she's going to look over all the cities and towns across the region to decide their travel plans and she's going to have to take into account the fact that they've already managed to get a gym badge without a single battle, so she wants to make sure she takes full advantage of this. Especially now that they have the boss's support, they may be able to get away with a lot more than they did last time, especially since how they proved that they were so capable in handling opposing factions and being able to dismantle them from the inside out. And here, Jesse hits paydirt, as the house also has a vast study, and inside are many maps that James's father has collected over over the years. A lot of these maps of Sinnoh are a couple of hundred years old, so that means that Jesse is going to be able to make a very detailed plan on where their first and last points of attack are going to be. There is going to be no point of the region that is left unturned as far as the redhead is concerned. So while Jesse gets to work, James takes the time to secure a few things. As with the assistance of Sebastian, he's able to make an encrypted call to the base of Team Rocket that is in the Hoenn region, as he has one person that he is trying to reach and that is of Domino. He immediately greets the Black Tulip, to which catches Jesse's attention as she rushes to the screen to greet her old friend. However, as the two girls begin to gossip and catch up, James reminds Jesse that they have a lot of things to do, and this is not a pleasure call, it is a business call, to which the redhead sighs and gives him a bit of a grumpy face before she shuts off to going back to her maps. James informs Domino that they've managed to get the balls back for Nummel and Berloom, so he would like to
to send them over and have the Pokemon sent back, to which Domino has no problem doing. After all, all of the Pokemon that they left behind have been more than helpful in the base, and everything that Jesse did for Domino when they were in Hoenn together is something that the Black Tulip won't forget. So James quickly transports the balls over to Hoenn, to which Domino quickly and efficiently gathers up the two Pokemon and sends them back over. And just before James hangs up with Domino, he informs her that he would like to keep this on the down low and doesn't want anybody to know, to which Domino has no problem. Considering they don't have any Pokeballs and they're a little bit short-staffed here, the Pokemon could have easily wandered off during a time that they were unattended, which James thanks Domino before hanging up the phone. However, as the call is disconnected, Sebastian chimes in, asking Master James if that's the only Pokemon that he's going to be taking with him. Smiling, the purple-haired man says no, he was considering his old other friend as well. As James walks down the hallway to his childhood room and opens the door, and right there in the middle of the room sits an old Pokeball covered in dust. It hasn't been out of its ball in quite some time, I'm afraid, Sebastian says. However, I'm sure it's going to be excited to see you. To which James smiles as he picks the ball up and pops it, only to reveal a Pokemon that nobody knew that he had, a grass type known as Carnivine, which immediately wraps its tentacles around James as it gives a great big hug to the purple haired man. The grass type is happy to see James as it hasn't seen him in many years, not since he was a little lad. James tells Carnivine that he's here in the center region for quite some time, and he's going to need its help, so he's going to be bringing the grass type with it, to which Carnivine is more than happy to tag along with its trainer, considering they never got any proper time to actually spend together. So, with James now securing the final member of his team, everyone gets to work, and they do what they can to prepare over the course of the next seven days, to which has been rather fruitful, as Meowth has been able to assemble some quite interesting technologies, and not only that, but managed to tweak their Pokedexes. While he wasn't able to completely get rid of the tracking device inside of it, he was able to kind of reverse its frequency. So no matter where they're at in the region, it's going to be able to give off a reverse signal. So if they're in the east side of Sinnoh, it'll say that they're in the west side of Sinnoh, which is going to be very helpful for covering their tracks, especially if somebody else is able to tap into this technology and figure out that they're here trying to operate under any type of radar. But unfortunately, as Meowth is explaining all of these trinkets to Jesse and James, a somber look comes across the boy's face as it prompts a reaction from Jesse and Meowth, asking what exactly has been going on with him. Over the last couple of days, James has just been down, to which he reveals that with him spending so much time around these familiar settings, it has him missing his parents, and he throws out the idea that maybe they can talk to each other, and they might be willing to let them work out of the house, as it is a great place for a base of operations. Jesse and Meowth remind James that the last time they met his parents, they tried to have him marry that harlot Jezebel, but James states that maybe they've changed, only for Sebastian to state that his parents are not coming alone. He was informed this morning that they're going to be bringing a guest, and it is in fact Jezebel, so it's in the best interest of this entire matter that Master James and his friends don't stick around. James thanks Sebastian for his honesty, as he could have turned him into his parents and not even told him what was happening. However, Sebastian reminds James that he always treated him well unlike his parents, so he will do whatever the young master needs, even if it's to help hide his presence, to which the boy wells up with tears in his eyes before hugging the old butler. So with the news that the three can't stick around, they decide to set off early the next day at the revelations of all this news. While they don't have a solid plan of where they're going to be heading all out at this point, as Jesse has several different ideas of plans of attack and places that they may be able to find information drawn out on several different papers, there is one clear place that is going to be their first stop, and that's going to be the gym in Eterna City. It's the closest point to their position, and could be a great place to establish their roots, no pun intended. So after a heartfelt goodbye with Sebastian, our trio sets off, doing their best to cover their tracks so that way James's parents don't catch on that the boy was here. A few hours later, and James's parents, along with the harlot Jezebel, arrive. They comment to Sebastian that the house seems kept, and the atmosphere is much lighter than it has been in their past visits. Trying to hide the fact that James is here because he always adored the boy, he states that it's always nice to have the masters back at the house. He hopes that they are going to be able to stay longer than their last visit, but unfortunately his parents state that they will not as they don't like the cold weather of the Sinnoh region. They only like coming here when it's warm, and they're only using this as a temporary stop until their plane and supplies are ready so that way they can travel to the Orange Islands for their summer getaway, as they plan to spend an extended amount of time there 
this year. However, as Jezebel quietly walks around the house with a stern look on her face, she notices something. The door to James's childhood bedroom is slightly ajar. Using this as a signal that something may be off, she decides to head in. And since Sebastian is doing his best to try and entertain James's parents, he doesn't notice that the redhead has entered the bedroom. This is going to be a grave mistake on the part of the butler, as a screech comes echoing down the hall from James's bedroom, causing Sebastian and James's parents to run down the hall to make sure that nothing had happened. However, as they enter the door, Jezebel begins to panic as she demands to know why Sebastian kept the fact that James was here from them, to which the butler adamantly denies. He hasn't seen the young master in many years, not since he was a child, and he caught his carnivine. However, the moment that comment slips from his lips, Sebastian knows the problem, as Jezebel can see that the Pokeball that carnivine has always rested in is no longer in the room. Jezebel can see that Sebastian is not being truthful by the look on his face, so she confronts the butler and decides to torture him and berate him with questions until he reluctantly cracks and informs them that James was here. Jezebel demands to know where he has gone, to which she learns that he was headed towards Eterna City. So after discussing it with James's parents, they have decided that they're going to remain in Sinnoh for the time being, as there's a chance that they could get their son back. However, Jezebel tells them not to worry, she will be staying here in Sinnoh. They need to head back to Kanto and begin to plan their wedding, because she's going to be the one to head up the efforts in finding James, so that way they can finally tie the knots. And this is where we are going to bring things to an end. So tell me, how did you feel about this part? What did you think about them arriving in Sunny Shore as a starting place, and the fact that their first gym battle really didn't happen because the gym leader doesn't really want to battle anybody? How about the fact that they are able to secretly get Numel and Berloom back on their teams without Giovanni noticing, and the fact that James was also able to get his child her companion Carnivine. And how about the fact that Jezebel is going to be staying in the region and hunting down our heroes? What does this mean for James in particular? Let me know your guys' thoughts in the comments down below.